Good evening and welcome to our service of Evensong on this second Sunday of Easter. Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia. In Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Jesus said, I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive for ever. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel in silence and remember God's presence with us now. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Grant, we beseech thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people, pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins, and serve thee with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Our psalm for this evening is Psalm number 30, verses 1 to 5. I will magnify thee, O Lord, for thou hast set me up, and not made my foes to triumph over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Thou, Lord, hast brought my soul out of hell, Thou hast kept my life from them that go down to the pit. 
Sing praises unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks unto him for a remembrance of his holiness. For his wrath endureth but the twinkling of an eye, and in his pleasure is life. Heaviness may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So the presidents and the satraps conspired and came to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the councillors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an interdict, that whoever prays to anyone, divine or human, for thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions. Now, O king, establish the interdict and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and interdict. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room open towards Jerusalem, and get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him, just as he had done previously. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy before his God. They approached the king and said concerning the interdict, O king, did you not sign an interdict that said anyone who prays to anyone, divine or human, within thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions? The king answered, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they responded to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the interdict that you have signed, but he is saying his prayers three times a day. When the king heard the charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel, and until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. Then the conspirators came to the king and said, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no interdict or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then, at break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. When he came near the den, where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel then said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He has showed strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. 
He remembering his mercy, hath opened his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from Mark. When he learned from the Sadduin that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, now let us thou thy servants depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to light on the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Let us join together in saying the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endure thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Almighty Father, who has given thine only Son to die for our sins, and to rise again for our justification, Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve thee in pureness of living and truth, through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works to proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, and that both our hearts may be said to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Enlighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy, Defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thine only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now Carol Kidd will lead us in our intercession. In faith, let us offer our prayers to our risen Lord. We pray for the world in all its beauty and brokenness. Lord of creation, shine your resurrection light into all places darkened by violence and hostility, famine and greed, natural disaster and environmental destruction. May we seek to play our part in caring for your world, ever mindful of the need to conserve and protect, nurture and share, both now and in the future. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the Church, its ministers and all who proclaim the message of salvation. Lord of might, Bless and empower all bishops, ministers and Christian leaders throughout the world as they seek to serve others in familiar and new ways this Easter tide. 
May the example you set your disciples inspire and enhance all worship and mission in your name during this time of pandemic and beyond. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the Queen, our government and all in authority. Lord of power, bless Elizabeth, our Queen, with a continuing sense of your presence to ever guide and sustain. Strengthen the resolve of politicians and those with the heavy responsibility of leadership at this time. May they have the wisdom to take the best possible decisions in the light of the current situation. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for our local communities. Lord of mercy, be alongside those who are providing health and care support, public and essential services, or who hour by hour put their lives at risk in the service of others. Be with the lonely, the fearful, those who are anxious not only for their health, but also for their businesses or for future employment. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for all who are sick in body, mind or spirit. Lord of compassion, be ever with those suffering acute or chronic illness. Sustain them in times of pain and distress. Comfort and bring hope to all affected in any way by the coronavirus, their relatives and their friends. Sustain the staff of hospitals, care homes, hospices and those working in the community, providing care to those most in need. We take a moment to hold before you or speak aloud the names of those we know who are in need of healing prayer. May they know the peace of your presence now and always. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the bereaved, all who mourn, and the souls of the departed. Lord of eternity, we bring before you all who weep and are heavy hearted, sad and grieving for loved ones. Be with them, Lord, and hold them in your tender care. Let us in silence remember those who we have loved and see no longer in this world, and especially at this time, all who are dying and have died from COVID-19. Through your resurrection, O Lord, hope can be found, for death is swallowed up in victory. By your grace, may the souls of the departed rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We offer ourselves in service to our risen Lord, Lord of peace, grant us at this time the strength to persevere through uncertainty and isolation. In your mercy and love, may we find release from fear and anxiety, hope for the days to come, even to eternity. Through faith in your Easter message of new life, we believe that nothing can separate us 
from your everlasting love. And so we offer to you all that we are, all that we do, and all that we pray. Concluding our prayers this evening by sharing together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen. In the name of God, whose truth we seek. So, Low Sunday. Well, that's what this day used to be called in the old Book of Common Prayer, and it still is in some denominations. But why? Well, the general consensus seems to be that it's called low in contrast to the high of Easter Day last Sunday. But whilst it may complete the Easter week, it in no way finishes the season. Easter shouldn't be written off as soon as we've eaten all the chocolate eggs, for the Easter season carries on and resurrection hope continues for as long as we have faith. Some may feel that Low Sunday is an anticlimax after the joy of Easter, and it's true, of course, that the disciples and the women who came to anoint Jesus would have, had, would have felt low immediately after the events of last weekend. They would have imagined that they'd been let down, abandoned, having lost the bodily company of their leader, teacher and friend. The true concept of resurrection would only be slowly dawning on them and surrounded by those who still saw themselves as Christ's enemies, they would feel vulnerable. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Just imagine if you were hearing Mark's Gospel for the first time tonight, and that was the only account of the resurrection that you'd heard, what would you think of it? Would it actually tell you anything more that those women fled in terror? Would it hint at the rest of that story, which in reality, of course, we now know? For them, they really were disorientated, not knowing what was to follow, or who would help them. So let's think about the emotions, the shock and the despair of the women who had come to anoint the body of Jesus. As they went, their main worry and concern was about who might be around to help them roll away the stone. But that paled into insignificance when faced with the stark reality that the tomb was open and Jesus was not there. Instead, there was an angel with a message from Jesus, which specifically told them to find the disciples and Peter, that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. The disciples and Peter. So why was Peter singled out like that? To the women it was not important, but to Peter it would be an affirmation that despite his human fallibility in denying Jesus, he was back in the fold, as it were. True, it would have been a terrible, guilty reminder to Peter of his previous action, but now he could face Jesus again, comforted by the knowledge that he was forgiven. But what they would gradually learn was that Jesus had not abandoned them that far from this being the end of their journey, it was really just the beginning. That journey was to become a turning point for them, a new dawn, a new understanding of their relationship with Christ, and it gives us a living example for us to follow as we make our own journey, our own adventure, exploring and developing our faith, which also guides us to the Kingdom. Our passage from Mark this evening ends rather abruptly, a dramatic cliffhanger which leaves us asking, yeah, and so what happened next? 
This is how the original version of his gospel ends, but another dozen verses were added, maybe by somebody else, and you might argue that the missing verses are the most important part of the resurrection story. Indeed, they contain the narrative of the commissioning of the first disciples, more often quoted from Matthew's Gospel, which commands them and us to proclaim and share the good news of the Gospel, of the resurrection, of our very salvation. Without that, our faith would present a very different framework of belief and code of conduct. Like those first disciples, we may be feeling low at the moment in the light of the events and consequences of the current pandemic. And so there can be some emotional parallels with those who had just witnessed the traumatic events of the death of their friend. They had experienced unexpected, inexplicable loss, sacrifice and suffering and in totally different circumstances, we are equally disorientated, fearful, and maybe feeling abandoned. So what does their experience nearly 2000 years ago teach us for our situation today? Remember, we have the benefit of the knowledge of what came next, the understanding of the missing part of Mark's account. We know what the women and disciples could never know at that time. Through faith and the teachings of Scripture, we now know the revelation of the re resurrection, the real meaning of salvation. The comfort of our faith, built on that knowledge, enables us to face our present time of testing with more strength than the first disciples possessed. Yet it is their example that guides us gives us hope for the future, gives us a future even. As Christ began to appear to them again, as he accompanies them on their new as yet unknown journey, so he will be with us. Knowing that we have the strength, guidance and support of Christ is what makes the many random acts of kindness and compassion of today possible. The comfort of his presence around and among us is what will see us through this crisis, enabling us to take pragmatic and sensible actions to ensure that this world pan that pandemic subsides. As disciples and as ambassadors of Christ, we must witness through our lives so that others who see us can understand the inner meaning of our faith re revealed in the context of the way in which we live it. Our loyalty and obedience to God demands that we interact responsibly with others with whom we share our faithful lives. Amen. And now for our blessing. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life until the shades lengthen and the evening comes, and the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon us and remain with us always. Amen. And so let's join together in singing that great hymn, To God Be the Glory. <laughs> <laughs> 